and in First Peter chapter four. Mark chapter eight, verse twenty seven and following, and in first Peter chapter four. Most of this will not be much new to most many of you. In fact, I've hit some of this before. But uh, it's always good to hit something again. Mark 8, 27. Mark 8, 27. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Okay, the answer will give you some insight into his personality, what he was actually like. And they answered, uh, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. So if you check out those fellows, you can find out about the personality of Jesus Christ. And he saith unto them, uh, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests, that's the religious crowd, and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. All that came true, every bit of it. And he spake of that, saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned... About and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. That's interesting. Here's a person that says the absolute right thing in verse 29, and then he turns around not two minutes later and says the absolute wrong thing. That quick. 34, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Where, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his angels, or with the angels. Okay, now First Peter 4. Okay, you can see what's going on there. The Lord Jesus Christ uh, is talking about suffering. And his suffering, what happened at Calvary, he predicted it uh, in detail, precisely. Predicted his resurrection from the dead and fulfilled everything. Okay, 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy." If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Now that verse, verse 14, is easy to understand and read, but uh, to actually believe it in your heart, you must personally experience it. When you personally experience verse 14, you could fully say, yeah, that's right, about the happiness. 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Okay, notice that word, Christian. That's the only, uh, one, that's one of three occurrences in the Bible. Okay, and so uh, we're going to go on that for a little while. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray you help us understand these words. Help us see what the Bible says. Help us to apply it to ourselves. Help us to understand the definition of thy word. And help us to uh, clearly understand what uh, your word says uh, about certain issues and about this topic of being a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're not going to look at the doctrine of Mark 8. 
in 1 Peter 4, but just real quickly, the doctrine of Mark 8 is Jesus Christ preaching about a religion called Judaism prior to Calvary. Okay, that's what he often preached about. That's the religious structure he grew up under and lived under. Okay, Judaism. Uh, after that, in 1 Peter 4, this is, again, dealing with the same religious structure, but uh, with the variation, it is now after Calvary, and the time period doctrinally will be uh, what's known as the Tribulation. It is uh, focused at, if you look at chapter 1, verse 1, strangers or Gentiles who are scattered throughout the world. That's just the doctrinal footing. Notice in 1 Peter 4, verse 16, it says, suffer as a Christian. It's not implying they are a Christians. It's saying suffering as a Christian. And now, if you ask the average American on the street about the word Christian, you have certain ideas. Two people who are born again are saved people. The word Christian today generally refers to salvation. Somebody who is saved, somebody is born again. Okay, that's just what people think. If you ask somebody, are you a Christian? What you're asking in your mindset is, are you born again? Are you saved? Now, the average religious person in this country, uh, the word Christian uh, generally will refer to a denominational structure. To uh, men who revise history, that write history books, when you read the history books and you read about Christianity fighting Islam during the Crusades, the historian's definition of Christianity is Catholicism. Now, a consistent Catholic, a Roman Catholic, and I've talked to a few of them, when you, if you would ask them if they are a Christian, again, thinking salvation... They, I've had a few of them say, I ain't Christian, I'm Catholic. Okay, because the ones who are consistent know that there's a difference. Now, historians, whenever they use the word Christianity, they almost always are referring to Catholicism. Okay, now, to the average uh, non-religious person, a Christian, they think in their mindset could be an American. When I was in high school and then 10th and 10th grade... <clears throat> In history class, we had like, <clears throat> excuse me, I think about 20 students in the class or 20 skulls full of young mush, I guess we you can say. And the teacher asked, how many of you were Christians? Well, in my head, that's salvation. And my buddy was sitting next to me and he looked at me and he said, well, I'm an American, I'm a Christian, he raised his hand. And I looked at him and I said, no, you're not. Because that's what he was thinking it meant. Now, if we find out what the Bible says, that's something totally different. Okay, in order to find out what the Bible word for Christian, we've got to run it in the Bible. Now, a lot of people think, well, man, the word Christian probably is in a Bible hundreds of times. Actually, it's only in there three. And they often think the same about religion. When people see the Bible, they think, oh, that's a religious book. And the word religion and religious, obviously, is all throughout there. But the contrary is true. The word religion and religious only occurs seven times. Twice in Acts, twice in Galatians, three times in James, and that's it. In every occurrence of the word religion in the Bible, it's referred to Judaism, not Christianity. Because Christianity technically is not a religion. It's a relationship. It's an individual basis. People always like to put themselves in groups. And where in the New Testament, God wants us to be individuals. You know, in, in American history, this is called the rugged individualism. Okay, and so uh, the gap, if you look at churches and travel the country and read the Bible, when you read biblical Christianity in the book of Acts or closer to the end of the book of Acts, you will see there is a major gap between the Bible Christianity that it promotes and what is pushed off as Christianity today the gap is as wide as the Grand Canyon itself. Big gap. I mean, if you just honestly compare them back and forth. The spirit of this age that we, you and I are living under is conformity. 
conformity. Conform, conform, be like everybody else. This is a society. The news media says this. The public schools, the state education says this. The magazines say this. Conformity, conformity, conformity. You need to be like this. Where the Bible itself says, be not conformed. Romans 12, verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. In fact, the word conformed and conformed occurs three times in the Bible. One says, don't be conformed to this world system. The other one says in Romans 8, 29, God intends for you and I to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 29. Not only that, he says in Philippians 3, verse 10, you are to be conformed to His death. If you want to have fellowship with Jesus Christ, the way you have fellowship is you have something in common with Him. And Philippians 3, verse 10 says, that, that I may know Him in the, in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. Now, that is not a Christianity that is preached or taught on Christian television. You know, Paul and Andrew Crouch, or Paul and Jane Crouch, and I guess that's his. You know, with their uh, makeup as duded out as much as they de- have, uh, they have never seen biblical Christianity one day in their life. When they have seen glimpses of it, uh, they get mad and want to run away from it as fast as they can. The Christianity on the television is not going to be Bible Christianity. The Christianity of Tim and Jimmy, Timmy Fay you know, uh, showed on uh, PTL, that means pass the loot, uh, many years ago, uh, that was not biblical Christianity. There's a large gap between that and Bible Christianity. Now, we're going to look at the word Christian, uh, the word Christian in the Bible. It only occurs three times. I'm going to look at the Bible usage of the word. If you would look in Acts 11, verse 26, the first time it shows up. Now, in particular, as far as uh, looking at this word today, the word Christian in the Bible, technically speaking, is not referring to salvation or being born again. Okay, that's the Bible usage of the word. And for this context, that's where we're going to look at it. Okay, if I would say to a person that he is born again, but not a Christian... That would be used in the Bible definition. I'm not saying he's lost. I'm not saying that person's going to hell. I'm just saying he's not following the Bible definition of the word Christian. Okay, when I use the word Christian in this context, we're not referring to salvation or the lost condition of a sinner. And I'm not referring to what a lot of times people call a professing Christian versus a confessing Christian. A lot of times, uh, people getting up in years, if you ask them some uh, questions about salvation, about heaven, about are they born again, uh, the older people get, you may know the right answers to the questions, but whether it's in your heart, you can deceive yourself. A lot of people know the right answers to a question, but that don't make a man saved. You see, confessing Christian or professing Christian... Some people put it like this because they say, well, he professes to be a Christian, but boy, his life sure don't show it. He's probably not confessed Christ. That's not the context I'm using at all today either. Okay, as far as the characteristics of a Bible Christian, okay, we're not referring to somebody being born again in the context of the term. If you would look at Acts 11.26, if you're there, this is the very first time the word shows up. And uh, this verse 26 has two sentences, and it says, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. Antioch, that's a, in a country called Syria back then. Okay, today this is all Muslim-dominated territory. This would be north of Lebanon, Antioch of Syria. That became the focus of of uh, Christianity throughout in the book of Acts. It, it made a shift in the book of Acts starting at Jerusalem as the center of uh, activity, of uh, focus of God, and then shifted over a place called Antioch in Acts 11.26. 
And then it says, And it came to pass, well, it looks like it's got three sentences. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So, right here is our first characteristic of a Bible Christian. A Bible Christian is, is someone who is associated with Antioch. You say, well, I don't, that don't mean anything to me. I don't live near Antioch. Well, neither do I. But we've got to find out what is this thing about Antioch. Okay, if you're in Acts 11, back up to Acts 6, and we can discover something about Antioch. Acts 6, verse 5, you'll see the last word in the verse, the very first of, uh, time the word Antioch shows up in the Bible. And what's it connected with? Verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicornor, and uh, Timon, or Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Seven fellows... Some often say these were the first deacons. But notice that Antioch is associated with some men who are full of faith in the Holy Ghost. Obviously, some good men. Okay, now if you keep reading down, there's another word that's going to be contrary to this in verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Syrians, okay, and or Cyrenians, and the and Alexandrians, and of them of Sicily and of Asia, notice, disputing with Stephen. Now, the Libertines and the Cyrenians, you know, that's not really an issue. Uh, you know, they don't really have history that traces to today, but Antioch, or the Alexandria does. Now, keep those two in mind. I'll explain that a little bit further. Okay, so the first characteristic of a Christian in the Bible is somebody who is associated with Antioch. What does that mean? Well, you have two types of people in the world, saved and lost. You have two types of religions in the world, if you analyze them. One is a religion of works, where you've got to do something. The other is, is something of grace. Two types of religions. Not only that, can you boil it down, you've got two types of governments in the world. One is government tells people what to do. The other is the people tell the government what to do. That's what ours was originally founded for, and it's been shifted. That's usually in the minority. The saved of the two kinds of people, saved and lost, the saved are in the minority. Okay? And the same goes with two types of governments. And the same goes in the fashion of two types of religions. The vast majority of the world religions are religions of works, just different names. Islam, got to work to do something. Okay? And the other is the religion of grace. That's in the minority. Now, if we shift this into the Bibles that we find in America. There are two types of Bibles in America. You can go to any Christian bookstore. You probably could find a minimum of ten different translations. But there are basically two types of Bibles in there. All of them trace the roots of their Bibles to either Antioch or Alexandria. All of them do. Antioch is in the majority. Or I mean, the minority as far as the Bible is in English today. Antioch would be the roots of what's known as the King James Bible. Alexandria would be the names of the manuscripts of the NIV, New American Standard, Revised Standard, New Revised Standard, uh, the Contemporary English Bible, the New Jerusalem Bible, the Jehovah Witness Bible, uh, you know, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin Bible, uh, you know, Charlie Brown, Snoopy, and you name it, they got them. There's over 200 since 1880. Most of them went bankrupt, thank God. Okay, but the, probably the most popular one today outside of the King James Bible would be the NIV. The NIV comes from Alexandria. Now, you may not have experienced this, but if you want to experience this and do a little scientific investigation, get out on a street corner, hold up a Bible sign, start passing out tracts, and I will guarantee you that eventually someone with an NIV will come and argue with you. Alexandrian. 
They're going to tell you what you're doing is wrong. Now, yes, yeah, somebody from the world may going to argue with you also, but it's going to be the Laodicean Christians that's going to be the ones that tell you you're wrong. We've had it happen time and time again. And then we just smile and ask them about a couple of verses in the NIV, and then it's missing. And as soon as they see that it's missing, about three times, they take it and stick it in their purse and don't want to talk to you anymore. That ain't my problem. That's their problem. You see, Antioch in Acts 13.1 is the mission-minded people. And so that's the first thing. A Bible creator. What am I saying? Some of the NIV is not saved. I'm not saying that. They may be born again, but I am saying they're not a Bible Christian in the sense of the context of the Bible itself. Am I saying they're going to hell? No, I'm not saying that. The word Christian in the Bible is not specifically dealing with salvation. It is dealing with someone who is saved and then has other characteristics with it. Okay, Bible Christian is first associated with Antioch. The second one, if you would look again in Acts 11.26. Acts 11.26, again, you'll see that, la- that one sentence and it says, and the disciples, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. What's a disciple? Well, we've got to go other places to find out that definition. Okay, di- disciple, you can see the word is very close to the word discipline. <clears throat> So, a disciple is someone who is disciplined. But if you would, look in John 8, and we'll see a definition that the Lord Jesus Christ will give. At least one definition coming from the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, all three of these definitions will come from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a disciple is, in John 8, is defined by Jesus as this fashion. John 8, 30. And and as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This would be a disciple of Jesus Christ, which would also be a disciple of biblical Judaism. You can be a disciple of Christianity also. So that's what Jesus, so the definition there is in verse 31 is a disciple is somebody who is a continuous Bible student. He's not a casual Bible student. He doesn't casually read through the Bible. He is a continuous Bible student and he stays in it until the day he dies. I mean, Daniel was upwards around 90 years old, at least in his 80s. In Daniel chapter 9, and he's still studying his Bible, and he still came up some truth when he's 80-some years old. You say, well, I read through the Bible, you know, once every year. Well, that's, that's good, that's good, but uh, you can do better. I mean, that, that only takes, if you're a regular average reader, you're only talking 15 minutes. To read three and a half chapters a day, that's one through the Bible a year. You know, which is better than not. But still, it's a continuous Bible student. The reason why he says continue is because the more you get in the Bible, the more you're going to notice the gap between biblical Christianity and Laodicean Christianity. The more you're going to notice a gap between these things, and the more, if you start asking questions to certain people, you ain't going to be well liked. The more you start asking questions... Well, Pastor, why don't we have this? Why doesn't this happen? What about this? Why don't you just close that Bible for a while, okay? See? So a disciple is a continuous Bible student. The next thing, if you would back up to Luke chapter 14, a disciple is also a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, what kind of a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, Luke 14, verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. 
Now, you see the word hate there. Don't let your definition in your head deter you there. Find out the Bible definition of the word hate. Yes, it has a primary definition of a strong dislike towards someone, but there is a secondary definition, and you'll discover that the word hate means a matter of priorities. And you can find that by reading the English words in the Bible. If you look up the word hate in a concordance, you'll see them listed out chronologically. Go to the first one and you'll see the first definition chronologically in Genesis will be a strong dislike. And I think it's the third de- time it occurs in the Bible where, it's where Jacob loved Rachel and hated es- uh, Leah. Okay, but it wasn't uh, that he disliked her. He loved Rachel more. Matter of pri- and that's what this is aiming at. In other words, this is saying, be a fanatic follower of Jesus Christ. Now, fanaticism is honored by people in the world. Fanaticism is honored in all areas of life except a follower of Jesus Christ. You can be a fanatic of sports and get a multi-million dollar contract. Okay? You can be a fanatic of politics and get elected to office. People will honor you. Name roads after you. You know? Some of them need to be, have a stone road named after them. Okay? Uh, you can be a fanatic of, of uh, business and wealth and people will honor you. You can be a fanatic about religion. Mother Teresa was... And people will honor you. Uh, You can be a fanatic about many things. People will honor you. But as soon as you become a fanatic of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, you are often branded a nut. You're whacked. I mean, your elevator don't go all the way up. I mean, lights on, nobody's home. Now, if you did talk to any of these people, I don't care who you are, but you sit down and talk with these people and, and you ask them this question. If they're married, you ask them. Would you approve of your spouse stepping out on you once, maybe a year? Maybe twice a year? Would that bother you? What are they going to say? Of course. Oh, so are you wanting 100% loyalty from your spouse? Yes, that's right. That's what I expect. That's what I, that's what I said my vows. That's what I expect. Do you think Jesus Christ is any different? How does the Lord Jesus Christ feel when you and I put him on the back seat. You see, that's what's called hypocrisy. Where they want fanaticism in one area, but in another area, uh uh-uh. Forget that. You know, I was down at West Lafayette, down the street corner, a girl's on a cell phone going by me, and, uh, you know, I blurted out a couple things, and then she said, oh, I just walked by a bunch of nuts. And so then I just said, I may be a nut, but I'm screwed on the right bolt. And she just kept right on going. Yeah, I believe it looks foolish. It looks like we're nuts. It's a fanatic follower of Jesus Christ because he said, go out in highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Now, putting a condition on this idea of following Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ preached some doctrines that are not directed to you and me. Born again, Gentiles in the church age. Why? He was living under the religion of Judaism. And so now we have some variations. And the variations come through a man named Paul. Paul was taught by Jesus Christ after the resurrection and probably taught on Mount Sinai. You know, just like Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, he says, Be followers of me as I am of Christ. Why did he put it like that? For example, if you follow the Old Testament law, which Jesus Christ did, and in Deuteronomy chapter 13, you read in there where you are to kill a heretic. I mean, literally kill him. The death sentence put on a heretic. Paul was doing that when his name was Saul in Acts chapter 8. And when Saul met Jesus Christ, became a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, his name was changed to Paul, you see that he quits obeying Deuteronomy 13. Why? Variations. 
Things, things have changed. And so, he says in Ephesians 5, verse 1, Be followers of God as dear children. How are you to follow God? Just like a little child follows his parents. He says, That's how we're a humble, sincere little child. Okay, the next thing. So, a Bible Christian is a disciple. A disciple is a continuous Bible student. A disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ. In Luke 14, as you keep reading, the Lord Jesus Christ raises this followership a uh, one more level. 28. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and count the cost, whether we have, he have sufficient to finish it? Thus happily, after he had laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to, uh, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Uh, or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all, a little fanatical, isn't that? Forsaketh not all, that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Now, this is raising the level up to being a soldier of Jesus Christ. What does a soldier do? Now, you hear a lot of people saying, well, people in the military, you know, they're in the military because they're, you know, uh, serving their country. Now, if you buy that, i got a bridge I'd like to sell you. What is their motive? What, what is their enticement to get somebody to volunteer? It's money. It's money. Granted, I would say a few, and I would say the soldiers back in the 1940s went for their country in spite of the money. Today, it's the buck, my friend, and don't forget it. Nine times out of ten, it's the buck. College scholarship, you know, college fund. It's the money, man. It's the money line. Out in Alaska, they were even offering some guys hundred grand who were in the military and they needed them back in, they were offering them $100,000 to sign in. The guy says, that's tempting, but no thanks. I mean, here, the soldier of Jesus Christ is somebody who counts the cost, and the cost that's being counted here could result in death. That's a soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, you, if you've read some missionary stories, you may have crossed a missionary story about a fellow named Bill Borden. Bill Borden was an heir of the Borden Milk Company. Bill Borden had lots of money that he could have had, could have died in very great wealth, and Bill Borden got born again and became a Bible Christian. In other words, a disciple of Jesus Christ and went to a foreign field. And I don't know how long he was there, but he was not there long but he was martyred for Jesus Christ. And the average person in the world says, what a waste. And Jesus Christ in heaven says, what an honored soldier. You see? Why? Because he was suffering for his Savior. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, it says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If you would, go to the second occurrence of the word Christian in the Bible. And it's in Acts 26, verse 28. Now, remember in 1 Peter, we read that suffer as a Christian. Suffer as a Christian. This is the third characteristic of the Bible word Christian. And the word Christian in the Bible is someone who is associated with suffering. The suffering comes in different fashions. Sometimes it's an actual literal death. Sometimes it's just harassment from people. Sometimes it's people getting beaten up. Sometimes it's just somebody who's stabbing you in the back with their words. People who often who stab you with their words would like to stab you with a knife if they had the courage. Okay, Acts chapter 26, verse 28. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's in what is known as the Supreme Court. This would be like our Supreme Court, only this is the Supreme Court of Rome. He's in front of the king. And he says in verse 27, Acts 26, 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. 
Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now, I don't know what is in his in mindset. Is he saying, you almost are persuading me to get saved? Or are you almost persuading me to get saved and live like you do? I don't know. As you read through this trial process, it begins around chapter 22. And when you read through that in chapter 25, you will see one guy says to Paul, you're mad. You're crazy. Much learning doth make thee mad. And that's often what people say to you You after you're publicly for him. You're nuts. But when you sit down with an individual, someone who's really trying to search the truth, they're going to have to agree with you that you're right. Jesus Christ is worthy to be praised. And then Paul said here in verse 28 or 29, And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day, we're both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. Notice he is suffering. A Bible Christian is always associated with suffering. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you would look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Matthew 5.10, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, but this is a universal truth that runs through all ages. And then there's a similar sermon like this in Luke chapter 6. Now, when I say the word persecution or suffering, I'm not saying that you have to go out and die for Jesus Christ, you know, and get into Fox's Book of Martyrs. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you try to look for these things. I'm not saying that either. We have a missionary scheduled to come in September, and he's uh, planning to be a missionary to Indonesia. That's going to be a rough place. 90% Muslim, that is going to be a tough place to be. Okay, but if you would, in Matthew 5, verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted, notice, for righteousness' sake. For righteousness' sake. Per not persecuted because you're dingling. It's for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let's try another one. Luke chapter 6, verse 22. This is a similar sermon. It's not the Sermon on the Mount. This is a sermon on a plane, not an airplane, out in a flat place. Luke 6, 22. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Maybe you've witnessed for Jesus Christ in the job. Maybe you've spoken up for the truth in a job, and somebody says, Ah, oh, why are you a preacher? You know, instead of, oh, I can't believe you, you disrespected me like that. Just look at him and smile. Yeah, yes, of course I'm a preacher. Are you a sinner? And if they don't like that, you say, well, hey, come on. If you're going to dish it out, can't you take it? I'm a preacher. I like preaching sinners. If you're a sinner, I'm going to preach at you. You see? And this is most of the time the form you see in this country because a lot of times Americans are a little bit on the coward side. But if you look at our nation, if you know real history in our nation, why did the colonists come to this land? They were fleeing religious persecution, were they not? They were deathly afraid of religious persecution coming from the Vatican City. So much so that they didn't even want any Jesuits on the boat. Okay, they come over here because they didn't like a Catholic Pope, but they came over here and some of them mistakenly put up Protestant Popes. In Massachusetts, the main religious thrust at that time was Puritanism. Puritanism is a form of Calvinism, or is Calvinism. Why? They had a Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible is a Calvinistic notes in it. 
And here in Massachusetts lived a man named Roger Williams. Roger Williams was preaching to those people, you are wrong to steal the land from the Indians. They have rightful ownership and you should pay them for it. Amen. I agree with that. And then he turned around and said, and you people need to allow people to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience. Instead of forcing your Calvinism and making laws locally, promoting Calvinism, you need to allow people the religious freedom to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. He called it soul liberty. Those two issues made the people, the Protestants in Massachusetts, to act like the persecution they were getting from Vatican and they were wanting to kill Roger Williams over that. And so Roger Williams fled in the dark of the night with about four or five people, went down to a location, established a little place, and that place became known as Providence, Rhode Island. Roger Williams is the first a man who founded the very first Baptist church in the new land in Providence, Rhode Island. If you go to Providence, Rhode Island, you can find that building there with some of the history right there around it. And you see, Rhode Island of the 13 colonies became known amongst the colonists as the freest colony for religious liberty. And that provided you and I the basis of the first article of the Bill of Rights, the free exercise of religion. People don't know that. The freedom you and I have in this country is a direct result of Christianity, biblical Christianity. And if you look at any other nation in the world, whenever a religion becomes popular in that nation, you can tell about that religion, if it's a religion of tyranny, if the government follows the tyranny of that religion. Analyze any Muslim-dominated country. Do they have free exercise of religion? Can you build a Protestant church in Mecca today? I doubt it. I mean, it won't happen. Why? They have no religious liberty. Liberty comes from this book. It comes from Jesus Christ. What am I saying? I'm saying this, okay, a person may be born again, but are they a Christian? In other words, are they a continuous Bible student? Are they a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are they associated with suffering? Now, is that going to hit our country? People don't realize it, but if you would look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, is persecution, is hard times going to hit this country? It could. People don't realize how vulnerable Americans are. Do you realize that if the truck stopped running, that the average American would think they're starving to death in three weeks? Why? If the, stop, if the truck stopped running, your grocery store is going to be plumb empty within three days. You see, and First Timothy chapter 6, you need to realize also in this country, if you know the monetary system in this country, First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, you need to realize how vulnerable we are. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor... Trust in uncertain riches. You say, what's that? It's what you got in a bank account. You say, well, it's backed by the government. Hey, don't, don't bank on it, my friend. Don't count on it. Anytime the ones at the top want to start causing a depression or a recession, they can just do it at a whim. Stop printing the currency. You say, well, I'll go to the bank and take it out. Uh-huh. Yeah. You go to any bank and the max, the max, the amount of cash they got in that bank is the max 5% of the deposits they have in the bank. That's the max. Okay? And what I'm saying, I'm saying the riches of this country are very uncertain. The Great Depression was orchestrated by the bankers. That just did not happen by chance. And whenever they decide to do it again, they could do it at a whim the only one problem they got is they, they forget about God. If he says, yay, go ahead, it can happen. 
And this Bible promises you and I, I don't care how bad it gets, my God shall supply all your need. You see? And this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about suffering and persecution. Is that in store for Christianity in America? It might wake some folks up. If you would, look one more place. Hebrews chapter 11. Anybody who reads the Bible knows that Moses was a very unique character. And anybody who analyzes Moses' life would think this guy is a, is a nut. He was a real idiot. If you look at it from the world's perspective, if you look at it from God's perspective, this man was a very wise man. Hebrews 11.23, it says, By faith Moses... By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. Okay, what was the king's commandment at that time? The king's commandment was forced abortions. Of course, the abortion here was after birth. It's still, you know, murder. You know, whether it's within the skin of a person or outside the skin of a person, it's still murder. Okay, and the law at that time was to kill every boy, male child that was born. And Moses' parents didn't read, uh, you know, some of the things that people believe. Well, we're supposed to have made in government. They weren't going to go along with that. And they hid, his, hid their little boy. 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, this guy had it made. His wealth was secure for life. His position was secure for life. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But what did he do? Verse 25, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than Riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect on the recompense of the reward. What did Moses do? He looked at the big picture. That's what he looked at. The big overall picture. Now, under the Old Testament covenant, he would have been a Judaizer or Christian per se, meaning he not only believed his faith, he practiced it and he suffered the results of it. In the New Testament, yes, a person can be born again and not be a Bible Christian. They can be born again and on their way to heaven, but not suffering or serving Jesus Christ, becoming the word Christian as the Bible uses it. In other words, are you suffering any hardship or inconveniences because of your love for Jesus Christ? If not... You need to find out what biblical Christianity is all about. I mean, as they say, the water is fine. Come on in. It's a blessing. Be drawn closer to Jesus Christ. Okay? So let's stop there. Lord, I do pray you'd help us understand the differences between worldly Christianity, Laodicean Christianity, and the Christianity that is found in the Bible itself. And in many times in the history of this nation... Lord, thank you for the liberties that we have of, from, as a result of the people who fanatically follow the truth at the beginning of this nation. Lord, if they would have quit when hard times were done, uh, came on them, we would not have the freedoms we have today. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be grateful for the liberties that you have given us. And I pray you'd help us to be Bible Christians. Well, heads about and eyes are closed. If you're not certain that you are going to heaven, I'm not talking about you walked in a building and think you became a Christian. I'm talking about you personally placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and not any of your good works for eternal life. I'm not talking about you knowing the right answers to the questions. In your heart, do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior and your works absolutely have nothing to do with your salvation. And people in the past who died without the grace of Jesus Christ died and went to a literal lake of fire. 
That's dealing with salvation. If you are not certain that you are born again, we would be glad to show that to you. If you are born again, know Jesus Christ as your Savior, are you a Christian according to the Bible definition? A continuous Bible student. A Bible student of the right Bible. A disciple of Jesus Christ. Following the Apostle Paul. Fanatically and faithfully. Following Him wholly. With all your heart. Loving the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. While the instruments plays, the altar is open. A Bible Christian is different than a born-again believer. Both are on their way to heaven. One going to heaven as a result of Jesus Christ did, but most likely having nothing to show for their life. A Bible Christian trusting in the same Savior, but following Him wholly with all his or her heart, trying to give the Lord Jesus Christ rewards for His sacrifice. And in the process of trying to give the Lord rewards for His sacrifice, experience some of the same sufferings that Jesus Christ endured to give you and I salvation. Hardships, inconveniences, frustrations, persecution, and in some cases... A complete sacrifice of death for Jesus Christ. 